Well guys, this is the third part of this series, and we're finally at the very bottom of the disturbing Reddit post iceberg. Now don't worry if this is the first one you're seeing, you don't need to see them in order, and they get worse as they go on, so this is the most disturbing out of all three, so if that's what you're looking for, you're in the right place. These topics are truly disturbing and even repulsive at times, but yeah, just keep that in mind, I wouldn't watch this with your grandma or anything. Now with that being said, grab a snack, get comfortable, and close the blinds, because this is part three of the disturbing Reddit post iceberg. Ask a Rapist thread. This entry refers to a thread called Ask a Rapist, which I'll let Reddit historian Unholy Demigod explain. In mid-2012, a Reddit user realized that you see a fair amount of posts asking SA victims about their incidents, but none directed at the attackers, so he decided to ask the rapist to tell their stories. It turned out to be a storm of gargantuan proportions, as many people were empowering the rapists and even condoning their behavior as, quote, not really rapey. Not only that, it was in fact so bad that it was even dangerous. A psychologist made a follow-up saying how giving them an avenue provides the same feeling they get from raping someone. Sometime after everyone is going mental over it, the post and every single comment was removed by moderators to avoid doxing so nobody can read them anymore. Until now. As you can see, just as Unholy Demigod said, the entire original thread was deleted by the moderators, and for good reason. But of course, you didn't click on this video just to hear that, so using archive.org, I was able to pull the whole thing back up. Now, normally I include the usernames, but for this specific entry, I think it's probably best that I black them out. You'll likely not get a lot of honest response to this, so I'll throw in what I know. It's a couple degrees removed. My husband has worked with a lot of ex-offenders, and we've become friends with some of them, usually men who've done 20 plus years. One of my favorite guys, he's so ridiculously generous and you'll always get a laugh with him, he strangled two grown men with his bare hands 30 years ago. Then there's Don, I can't tell you how good hearted this guy is. So the context is that my husband is teaching this class for ex-offenders and I'm helping out. We get to know some of these folks pretty well and aside from the class stuff there's all these interesting conversations about race and crime and the broken prison system. But I digress. So we get to know Don and Don is one deep dude, smart, thinking, hardworking, sometimes brooding. Don likes to pick on me in that little sister kind of way. Some of it's sort of race related, I'm half Asian. The point is we've all got this great friendly relationship and at some point Don tells my husband that he deserves to know what his crime was. I wasn't there. Don instructed my husband to tell me because he couldn't do it himself. Don was a crackhead and started breaking into homes and robbing people to support his habit. One day he sees a white girl going into her building and he follows her up. The girl didn't know him and he didn't know her. So he waits a bit then pushes on her door. It's open. He catches her coming out of the shower. He's armed and she's naked, and she tells him that he can take anything, just please don't hurt her. But he did. He did hurt her. She was right there, naked and scared and weak, and he had the power to take the one thing you're not supposed to. Don says he raped another woman, which he was also charged for, but the police pinned an additional three or four rapes on him as well. He pleaded guilty. He did around 30 years. Now, I don't know if Don is lying about the other rapes, or if the police are lying, or whatever. He does admit to those two, and from everything I can see, he's sorry. I know Reddit doesn't like this, but he's Christian, and he's found a lot of comfort in his faith. He's hardworking, and he has a great job, and I almost never think of him as that guy. That guy who was a monster. It doesn't fit at all with the Don I know. But every once in a while, I think that somewhere out there are women who probably aren't much older than me. Women who are probably an awful lot like me who were brutalized by a guy I call my friend. It's like looking at one of those illusions that tricks your mind. No matter how long you stare, it boggles the brain. You can't figure it out. Yeah, I think you're starting to see why this thread is so messed up and difficult to discuss. This guy is literally a rapist, and he committed the act at least twice, or perhaps four or even more times. Now, normally, I'm the kind of person who thinks that people deserve to have a second chance, but what about somebody like this, who's done it multiple times? What do you think? I'm interested to see what you guys say in the comments. Let's take a look at another post in this thread. I wish this had more answers rather than a debate about how many rape cases are real or not. Here's the best I can give you, although I should be using a throwaway account right now because my friends know this one, but f it. Hi Kyle. I got obliterated one time at a party, I mean completely out of my mind. A person, also drunk, lied down next to me to cuddle, and eventually I decided to fool around with them. It took me a solid 5 or 10 minutes in my drunken stupor to realize that he had been passed out the entire time I was doing this. When I realized, I felt f***ing sick to my stomach and decided to tell them the next morning. Here's the thing though, I'm a girl. Immediately upon telling him this, he burst out laughing and called me a rapist and we went to breakfast with our friends. So in a way, I raped a dude. 
It scares me to think how that situation would have played out if the roles were reversed, and the reaction of horror and disgust that would have happened if I was a guy and I had to tell a girl what went down. TLDR, I could have been a criminal and a social pariah if I had different chromosomes, but instead I got free breakfast. Life is neat? Yeah, we're really walking on eggshells now. If the roles were reversed, do you think that this would have been completely different? I, again, I don't think this is something I really want to comment on, but I'm leaving it up to you guys. You guys can talk about this in the comments. Now I'm going to read one more from this thread, and then I think it's best that we move on. Okay, here it is. It happened when I was maybe 22. I had been visiting a buddy of mine who was living in a basement apartment in a college town. Upstairs lived a single dad and his teenage daughter. The dad worked nights if I recall. So I show up to my buddy's place and we're having a fun day hanging out, pre-drinking before we hit the bars that night. It was summer, the girl from upstairs had a couple friends over, and I can't remember how it happened but me and the girl, she was maybe 17, ended up play wrestling with me pinning her down. We were all laughing but when we made eye contact, it was that look we exchanged. The I'd f you look. I immediately got up and later me and my buddy went to the bar. That night would have gone like any other, drinking, dancing, hitting on women. I remember getting back to the house and my buddy led me into the girl's room. He asked her if I could crash in her room. I was kinda astounded that she actually said yes. I think that's when, in my drunken mind, I thought she must have wanted it. I was on one side of the bed, clumsily trying to play footsie with her. She seemed kinda nervous, but at the same time I remember she was saying kinda provocative things. At some point, I just said screw it and climbed on top of her and tried to kiss her. She tried to squirm away. Now, I remember exactly what I was thinking at the time. The girl gave me the look earlier. She invited me into her bed. What teenage girl would pass up the opportunity to be with a 22-year-old guy? She mu- Oh god, this sounds terrible, man. She must want it. I tried again and slid my hands over her body. It was then I looked at her face. She was petrified. I at that point pulled myself together, rolled off her, and apologized. My hormones were raging. I asked her why she didn't want to, and I told her the same things I just explained. She started to cry. I got up, apologized again, and went to the couch and spent the night staring at the ceiling thinking I was going to jail. When we got back, one of the girl's friends was there and demanded to speak to me outside. She quietly told me that her friend said I tried to rape her. She wanted to hear my side since the day before I seemed like such a funny sweet guy. I told her the story. She looked at me with a disgust I'll never forget and said that I may not have been an actual rapist, but that I was as close to one as you could get. I wanted to apologize again, but her friend said it would be best if I just leave. I got in my car and left right away. That was the lowest I've ever felt in my life. Now again, what makes these stories so morally complicated is that they're told from the first person perspective, so even though these people made a huge mistake and really fucked up, in the, in the strangest way, you almost feel bad for them. Like, not because of what they did, but like, can't you imagine the feeling of like driving away and having that pit in your stomach, feeling like, oh my god, I can't believe I just did what I did, you know? And that's not to excuse what they did in any way, of course, but Again, it explains the, the sort of complicated nature of these, these terrible things. I'm having a hard time even talking about this right now. It's definitely for the best that these posts were removed. Ted Bundy ruins OP's date. Alright guys, this one is pretty short, but it's fucking crazy. Wait till you hear this. On July 27th, 2012, user Quads Not Blades made a post on Ask Reddit titled, Reddit, what is the creepiest true story someone has ever told you? In a comment, user RW Bingham wrote the following. It was near Halloween time when my friends and I were telling ghost stories. My friend said she was going to tell a story about her parents' first date. She said she didn't like telling the story since it was actually true, but we prodded her on. To cut to the chase, the parents had spent a nice, if awkward, first date, and around the time that they would have said goodnight, the male in the situation, my friend's dad, suggested that they go for a midnight hike up to Provo Canyon. He apparently knew the place, and he had done a fair amount of rock climbing in the area, so the two drove up to the mouth of the canyon, got out of their cars, and started hiking just under the light of the stars since it was a new moon. At some point, the male starts getting a bad feeling since the pathway ahead, which would pass under some trees, would be dark. Also because it was starting to get quite late. He ignores the feeling and presses on. The female would say that she had felt the same feeling at what was probably the same time, though she didn't know the trail like he did. A minute later, the feeling came back to the male. He ignored it again and started walking a bit of the way into the trees when his foot hit something soft in the middle of the path. Under the trees, it was too dark to see just what the soft thing was, and the feeling came back stronger than ever. Instead of finding out what his foot had bumped into, he and the female both agreed to hightail it out of there. Years later, after being married for some time, they were watching an interview with a serial killer, Ted Bundy. In response to a question asking him to describe the time that he felt the closest to being caught, he explained about the night that he lured a girl into Provo Canyon and had just killed her, 
When he heard some people coming up the trail, he explained how he hid in the trees just in time only to watch some guy walk right into the body and for some reason just turn around and walk away. TLDR, friends' parents stumbled into a fresh corpse left by Ted Bundy on their first date. Yeah, what the fuck, man. What are the chances that the same exact story was told in the same exact location at seemingly the exact same time? I don't know. Creepy Landlord Alright, here's another one of those worst nightmare stories. This one was posted on November 26th, 2013 by user Kimmy Kisses on the Let's Not Meet subreddit, and honestly, this one's sure to make you look over your shoulder every once in a while. I will never know why or when it started. I'm glad for that, I guess. I moved into my very small apartment in February last year. My landlord, Olivia, was a sweet older woman who would cook too much and bring me much appreciated leftovers. She was great to me even after telling her my problem. I'm antisocial, but she didn't mind renting to a reclusive young girl who reminded her of her daughter. Every few weeks she would knock on my door then leave, letting me know she was leaving something for me. I loved that. Not even my family would cook so well. The next morning I wash and leave her empty containers outside my door, and by an hour or so she would take them back again. My other neighbors seemed fine, but I never talked or visited with them. I work from home, so anytime I was ever forced to go out, I rushed out and into my apartment to avoiding an uncomfortable situation. I loved living alone. It was everything I hoped for. I could just breathe. By April though, I started noticing things were not right. They were moving or just plain disappearing. I was convinced that it was just anxiety caused by my new medication and or the move. Another side effect was that it would make me really drowsy. Since I hated seeing the doctor, I just dealt with it. I take naps during the day now and eventually stopped caring until one incident doubled my paranoia. Olivia brought me some sort of Greek toss salad and dressing for lunch one day and I enjoyed it with my friend Netflix. I fell asleep in the middle of Portlandia and woke up that evening at 5pm. However, what was not usual was my bedding on the opposite side of me was disturbed. I only sleep on the right side. Always. Even more, it felt... warm. My first thought was that I must have rolled around a bit, but I knew it was too odd to dismiss. I got up and searched my apartment, gripping my phone with 911 typed in. Nothing else was disturbed, everything was exactly like it should be. I let it go. For the next few weeks, everything was normal, pardon the occasional misplaced shoe or drawn back shower curtain. I thought about telling someone, my parents, maybe Olivia, but if it's not life or death, I am not reaching out to anyone. I wasn't scared, I was nervous, maybe a little stubborn, but I stayed. I am not letting some stupid anxiety ruin my lovely, lonely world. May came and it was getting worse. My panties, toothbrush, hell, even my food was being misplaced. Every time I woke up, there was this strange odor in the air. I finally realized this won't go away by ignoring it. I called my mom and begged to come stay for a few days. When I got home, I told them everything. Saying it out loud solidified any creepy suspicions. That weekend, my dad went to my apartment and what was found was true horror. Written all over the walls, come back, baby please. He ran out and called the police. There was no one living in my apartment, but someone definitely had access besides me. The investigation revealed a man, Henry, the son of my landlord Olivia, was in a projected relationship with me. They showed me his confession on tape. He admitted to coming into my apartment every night and every day with his mother's extra key. He claims we were in love and he had my permission. He drugged his mother's food she left out for me, causing my drowsiness and falling asleep so he could come in and watch me sleep, touch my hair, kiss my shoulder. The leftovers I had in the fridge were tested and confirmed. I was absolutely horrified and disgusted. A man I never knew existed collected my drain hair, clothes, and trash, and practically lived in my apartment for four months. Okay, I'm sure this can't just be me, but for some reason this is like a, a sort of a rational fear of mine, I guess. It's just like when you don't own the place that you're in, you're just renting, um, it makes you realize like that key could be like anyone could have it, you know what I mean? What if like some old owner still has it and they like come in every once in a while when I'm not here, you know what I mean? Some weird thing like that. Like it's just the false impression of being alone, like you think you're alone, but you're not. Evil Sun. Again, I know I already warned you guys, but we are getting into some dark territory here, so don't say I didn't warn you. This post was made by Captain1958 on the Off My Chest subreddit on July 29th, 2013. I am not proud of my son. This Saturday, my son will have been sober for 18 months. He got his GED this year, and he starts at community college at the end of August. He finally has a job that I didn't get for him. Soon he will be moving into his own apartment and he hasn't missed a single appointment with his therapist. He has done everything you would expect of a 17 year old who hit a rough patch after meeting with a particularly bad influence. He is 29. 
This is the point where I'm supposed to say that nevertheless, I'm still proud of him for turning his life around, getting off drugs and off the streets, staying out of trouble and acting like a responsible adult, or at least an adult who knows the meaning of responsible. Maybe I'll throw in a reference to the prodigal son and kill a fatted calf for him. That's certainly what's expected of me. That's certainly what my son expects of me. He wants and demands praise and forgiveness and a party and me to hug him and tell him that it's all right. He demands me to tell him how proud I am and that he's made something of himself. But I'm not. Because he hasn't. Not in the slightest. His mother and I gave him every opportunity we could. I don't expect any praise for that because unlike my son, I don't expect praise for doing what you're supposed to. Her and I worked hard to give him a loving, stable, comfortable, supporting home. We were involved in his school, we introduced him to music to the extent that any two people can. His mother was a damn good cellist though. Sports and culture, we fed him healthy meals, we played with him. Thanks to him, we got in the best shape we've ever been in since our 20s. He started shoplifting at 15. The first time we caught him, we bodily dragged him back to the store, made him return the copy of Grand Theft Auto and apologize, and offered to pay for any damages. The second time we caught him, this time with a pair of shoes, we did the same thing. The third time, we started to go to family therapy. Therapy seemed to go well, and after a few sessions, the therapist asked for a few one-on-one -on -one meetings with him. After two of those, the police came knocking on our door because the little shit had concocted some story about how we were a religious cult who raped him for breakfast every Saturday. And the dumb chicken shit therapist actually believed him. Rational heads prevailed, we fired that therapist, and he went through six more in many months, until eventually we couldn't find anyone who would take him as a patient. By 16, he was drinking, then we found pot in his bedroom and in our bedroom. He started leaving needles, bongs, and crack pipes wherever he knew we'd eventually find them, just to f*** with us. I know this because he said so in those exact words. He had his first intervention and first trip to rehab that year, and his first relapse. He had to repeat a year of high school at 17, which meant he was now the ringleader of a group of other young dipshits who saw him as a totemic mentor shaman who could hook them up with whatever shit they wanted. I'm also damn sure he started f***ing one of his gang members' young sister, 13 around then, but I had nothing to go on but my own instincts, so all I could do was tell her parents to keep an eye on her. No charges were ever pressed, and the family never spoke to me again after that, but they did pull both of their kids out of that school, and my son was furious at me for daring to not let him continue committing statutory r He decided to try for normal r later on. While I was away, he spent an uncharacteristic night at home and on his best behavior. After his mother went to sleep, he followed her to her bedroom, took a knife with him, crept into the room, straddled her- oh my god, man. I don't know exactly what happened next. I know she fought, I know he stabbed her, I know she got away and locked herself in the bathroom before he could catch her. I hope that means she kicked him good in the balls. I know she broke the window and screamed for help. I know he ran. I know she was lucky the ambulance got to her before she bled to death. I know he called his friends to brag and beg a ride. I know the police caught him. I know if I'd been home or if I'd caught him, I'd have killed him with my bare hands. The state tried my son as an adult. He pled out, but only after making his mother testify and smiling the whole time. She divorced me a month after his sentencing. I looked too much like him. She killed herself a year later. I would be a liar if I said I didn't blame him for her death, because I absolutely do. He was sober when she went to her room, sober when he pulled out his knife, sober when he climbed on top of her, sober when he stabbed her, sober when he ran, sober when he called his friends to brag, and sober when the police found him. When I made the mistake of visiting him after the divorce, he laughed and said she'd had enough of his that I could never satisfy her. When I made the mistake of visiting him after she killed herself, he laughed and asked how it felt to have some prick take your bitch away. I should have killed him right there. It is to my eternal shame that I did not. They let him out after serving three years. He spent the next six years on the streets, in and out of rehab, on and off other people's couches, and would grace me every six months or so with a phone call demanding money. Eventually, I refused to talk to him unless it was to drive him back to rehab, and I stopped completely after he stole my wallet. Two years ago, he came to my house with his aunt, his mother's sister. He pretended to apologize. I slammed the door. His aunt barges in to try to shame me into forgiving the man who my wife caused her death, and laughed about it. He stayed outside, he slashed my tires, threw a brick through a window, and drove off in her car. His aunt had no idea that he'd taken the keys, or that he'd been armed the whole time. She blamed me. He guilted her into letting him stay with her, went to rehab and relapsed, then went again, and here we are. In stark contrast to the ball of sh that is my son and his life, I have watched my friends and colleagues, those who still talk to me that is, children go on to become doctors, lawyers, skilled tradesmen, actors and musicians, academics, entrepreneurs, and career military. I've seen a few start their own families, and even the ones who've had a rough start or who stumbled and fell manage to pick themselves up again and are bravely soldiering on. I have nothing but respect for them. I also note that they do not expect juice and a f***ing cookie for having a job and not getting hopped up on meth or their mothers for 18 whole months.
My son has pretended to reform before. He has even convinced himself once or twice, but he always backslides, always relapses, always finds new ways to disappoint, always hurts other people for his own short-sighted benefit. His aunt is already at the stage where she's pretending she must have forgotten where she put some knick-knack or piece of jewelry, and has already told me to f off after I've warned her of what my son can, will, and has done before, and what he will do again now that he thinks she is weak. When he f***s up again, when he hurts someone else with his ceaseless bull I will not be there to pick up after him. I am through with him. I am through with his aunt. I cannot talk to her without being overcome with rage and shame as I see the stupid, stupid hope I used to have that my son would ever amount to anything. And I do not need any more disappointment and failure in my life. I am not proud of my son. I am sorry for inflicting him upon the world. Wow, this guy is literally one of the most f***ed up, disturbed individuals I've ever heard of. At least at this point. I mean, literally, they get worse as we go on with these stories, but during my first time reading this, it was really hard to get past that line where he mentioned that she literally divorced him because he looked too much like her son. And then the fact that she committed like, right after that is just... just beyond words, honestly. I can't imagine the rage and the sorrow that this man must feel. I mean, I truly hope that he's found peace in his life and is able to move past this in some way. accidentally killed seven people. It doesn't get much more straightforward than that. This was posted by a throwaway account on May 1st, 2012 in response to another post asking, what's your secret that could literally ruin your life if it came out? I accidentally killed seven people. I put a rag into a new water heater exhaust to keep debris out and installed it in a rental. I get a call a week later, there's been an accident. I show up and there's a ton of EMs and police. They ask me where the gas shut off is, and I go down to shut the gas off and see the end of the rag I forgot sticking out of the top of the heater. I ripped the rag out, shut the gas off, and head upstairs only to be told all the tenants were dead. I drink all day now and sleep. It's killing me from the inside every single day, but if I say anything, my family is ruined. We have a bunch of rental properties and we'd be shut down. Two comments in response to this said the following. I think you owe it to every one of your current renters to have all your properties completely inspected. There's a chance that it wasn't the rag alone. And get carbon monoxide detectors for all your properties. And go get some counseling, because drinking all day is not a good solution. It's confidential, they cannot by law tell anyone what you tell them unless you threaten to harm someone and they believe that you will. This guy's right. Believe- This guy's right. Resolve to never have anything like that happen again and immediately go seek counseling. You cannot live alone with this knowledge. It will destroy your life and it will cause you to ruin the lives of those around you if you let this self-hatred fester and mount inside of you. You actually owe it to your family and to everyone else to get help with this. There's no going back, so you need to learn to live with this going forward. So many others who posted on this said that it probably wasn't just the rag, there's a chance that it was actually something else too, so if there is another problem, hopefully he wasn't reckless enough to not take care of it. OP gets revenge on her sister. Another very f***ed up story here. All we have to go off are two screenshots, because that's all that the iceberg linked to, so here's what they say. Time for condescending sister to learn a lesson. So I have four kids under five, one set of twins, and all the chaos that goes with them. My 30-year-old hashtag childfree sister used to really lord over me her Pinterest perfect marriage with no kids life. The breaking point for me was when she started referring to my house as the farm and our kids as the livestock. She knows that my first and third pregnancies, the twins, were accidents that I did not want and was not ready for, but she still makes fun of me as not knowing where babies come from and telling me to just admit that you love being a breeder. She really had me at the breaking point with all of her comments when we were over at her condo in November. I noticed she had a box of Nuva rings in the fridge. That's what I used too, and that's when inspiration struck. I took two of my Nuva ring sachets and over the next week put them for hours in the hot clothes dryer in a delicates bag hooked over the door so it wouldn't tumble around. Then when I was at her condo again, I swapped hers with my special Let's Make a Baby version. I wasn't sure if it would work, but it was all I could do to keep from laughing out loud when she asked me in December whether I had ever had an irregular period on the Nuva ring. She said her period had started before she removed her ring. That's when I knew my plan might work, and with any luck she'd be ovulating that month. She asked if I thought she should use condoms. I did my best to play it straight and told her the complete truth, that I was 100% sure that she had nothing to worry about. Of course I was sure she shouldn't worry about having unprotected sex. It's not like that's how babies are made, right? Then I slipped in another special Nuva ring in her box next time I was at her house, just in case it took a couple of cycles for his swimmers to do their job. Just to be sure, I checked her bathroom drawers to make sure there were no annoying condoms. Sure enough, little miss hashtag child free was doing the baby dance without any protection at all. It was so hard to keep a straight face when I saw her husband give her a pat on the butt and a kiss. I knew they'd be trying to make a baby as soon as we went home. 
Guess what? Hashtag child free sister is not going to be a mommy. She just told us today. Turns out she never had another period after the first special Nuva ring. This is going to be so much fun. I'm already planning on how to enjoy the next few years. God, this one is just disgusting. I mean, that is like a whole other form of violation. But anyways, there's another screenshot, so let's take a look at that. This is going to be the comments that were below that post. That's not cool at all. You've messed with several people's lives. Hopefully it will turn out for the best for their little family, but choosing to make a family for people who don't want one is really horrible. Her husband told mine a while back that he actually would be happy to be a father, and I think my sister will eventually be really glad this accident happened. She'll come around when she has a little boy or girl to hold in love. Her body is her body, not yours, and not her husband's, you sick person. Well, now her body belongs to her baby too. You're damn lucky she chose to carry the baby. She could have chosen to remain child-free and aborted. Then you would have been an accomplice to that child's death due to your sadistic and f***ed up lesson. I'm not even sure that I know exactly if I want her to know that this happened to her because there is no way she'd ever be able to trust her sister again. But at the same time, that's probably going to be a good thing, judging by what she just did. So, I don't know. I'm going to hear more about what you guys have to say about this in the comments. distracted husband. Well, at long last, three videos, all like an hour and a half long, and many, many posts later, we're at the final layer of the iceberg. So if you haven't already, go get a snack, get comfortable, because it's about to get wild. This entry refers to a comment made in response to an Ask Reddit post titled, Redditors who have had to kill in self-defense. Did you ever recover psychologically? What is it like to live knowing you killed someone regardless of whether or not you wanted to? The response in question was made on June 24th, 2015 by a throwaway account. Back in 1995, I lived in a quiet neighborhood on the San Francisco East Bay with my wife of a few years and our 20-month-old daughter. We had a small three-bedroom, two-story house, and one of our second-floor bedrooms doubled as my home office. One quiet Saturday morning, I was in my office playing Command & Conquer on my computer with my headphones on, oblivious to the sounds of the outside world. I'd probably been playing for an hour or so when, during one particularly quiet moment, I faintly heard my wife cry out downstairs. Knowing that she was down there with our daughter, I pulled my headphones off to see if she needed help with anything. Until the day I take my last breath, I'll never forget what I heard when I pulled them off. I heard the voice of a man with a thick Mexican accent shout, Quit yelling, bitch, or I'll f***ing cut your head off and f*** your f***ing daughter. My daughter was crying hysterically. After that, it was like some switch was thrown in me and my higher brain just shut off. I wasn't making decisions, I just acted. I don't even remember pulling the 45 from the lockbox in my desk. I just remember walking down the stairs slowly, scared as hell that I was going to see my wife dead when I reached the bottom. Instead, when I reached the bottom, I saw my wife half naked bent over the couch bleeding from somewhere in her upper body while being ripped from behind by some burly guy with a knife in his hand. He wasn't trying to rip her, he was in the middle of the deed. I never said a word to the guy, not while I was upstairs, not while I was coming down the stairs and not when I walked into the room. His back was to me so he had no idea I was even standing there. He was holding his knife in his right hand so that was the arm I grabbed with my left when I pulled him off. He spun away from her and me with a confused look on his face and I shot him square in the chest at nearly point blank range before he had a chance to say a single word. His face went pale as he went onto one knee and I fired twice more. One hit his neck and the second missed entirely. I was told later that the first shot was the fatal one. What happened next has always been a point of shame for me. The only thought going through my head at that point was that I couldn't let my daughter watch this man die. Without even checking on my wife, I scooped my daughter up and walked out my front door. As I walked to my driveway, I saw one of my neighbors standing there staring at my house. He'd heard the gunshots. The poor guy went pale when he saw me walk out, and I vaguely remember asking him to hold my daughter while I went and checked on my wife. The neighbor asked if I'd shot her, and I told him no, I shot the man who was raping her. I didn't realize at the time that I had the guy's blood spray covering half my body and that I looked like something out of a horror movie. I then handed him my daughter and my gun. I have no idea why I gave him the gun. And I went back into my house to help my wife. The police and DA gave me some flack about the exact circumstances of the shooting. One of the detectives told me that it was more of an execution than a defense. But in the end, they declined to pursue any charges. The man who attacked her turned out to be a guy with serious mental issues who had been previously convicted of two violent rapes, one of which was against a nine-year-old girl. As for recovery, I'd like to think that I've recovered from it, but it certainly induced a few behavioral changes. To this day, for example, I can't wear headphones that block out background noise. Even after years of counseling, over-ear and noise-canceling headphones give me panic attacks because I can't hear what's happening around me. I found out later that he'd been raping my wife for nearly 10 minutes before I heard him. 
and that he'd actually told my wife three times that he was going to rape my daughter when he was finished with her. I was sitting 30 feet away and I had no idea it was going on, and that fact has f***ed with me for years. My wife had a much worse time of it though, in addition to two stab wounds to her shoulder and upper arm, and the bruising and injuries from the forceful rape, she ended up having a mental break that took her years to fully recover. For the first six months, she absolutely could not be in any room by herself, and for more than a year she couldn't be in the house by herself, and she never returned to the house where this happened. For several years, she'd break out in a sweat when she heard men with deep Hispanic accents talking because she'd hear his voice again. Even now, decades later, she starts shaking if you try to talk to her about it. She's fine in every other sense, but even discussing it freaks her out. God, for those of us who have not had to go through anything like this, let's just take a second to appreciate it, because seriously, when something like this happens, you're usually never the same again. And beyond that, I hope that the daughter was okay. I know she was only like 20 months old when this happened, so she probably wasn't even forming memories, but I hope that there wasn't any like underlying psychological problems that happened. Ty, cry for help. This one has very little information to go with it, but I still think it's important to include. Now I'm going to apologize in advance because I think I'm probably going to butcher this, but on February 21st, 2017, the account Fujita Gaiken 001 was created. Immediately, it began to sporadically post the same message onto seemingly random subreddits. And it said this verbatim, I face to serious problem of human rights at Fujita Gaiken, Thailand. Please help me. They posted this exact line of text across at least 30 different posts, and none of them seemed to have any correlation at all. They were just like world news and different things. It seemed that they just wanted to spread this message as far and broadly as possible. None of these posts garnered much attention, if any at all. However, there was one post that I almost skipped over, and it read this in Japanese. Um, obviously I don't speak Japanese, um, but I did a quick translation, and it says, I'm being power harassed in Thailand. So I did a quick Google search, and I actually ended up finding a match. Fujita Gaiken isn't just a place, it's a business. Eventually, a post was made by the user Kaziel on the Reddit Bureau of Investigation subreddit. I clicked on a niche-promoted post on my Reddit feed and saw this comment by Reddit user FujitaGaiken001. I googled Fujita Gaiken and it's seemingly a low-profile factory in Thailand. Thai factories have a notorious history of essentially holding their workers hostage as slaves in disgusting conditions. I think there's a good chance this is real and that there are a number of people who need real and immediate help. I have no internet at home right now, and don't have the means to find out who to contact to have this investigated. If anyone who has the ability to find relevant resources could look into this and point appropriate authorities in the right direction, they would have my utmost gratitude. I know there's a possibility it might be a sick prank, but the name is awfully specific and I imagine near impossible to coax from Google. I'm going to have trouble sleeping tonight. That's all that we have on this story. It doesn't really sound like a joke to me. I mean, I can't really imagine how this would be a joke, and they didn't really seem to gain any attention at all anyway, or really even try to, so I have to imagine this is real, and I hope that anybody who was involved got out okay. The Bridge Another very unsettling one, especially when we get to the images. Hold tight for just a minute, we'll be there soon enough. This story was posted to the Let's Not Meet subreddit in 2012. The user has since deleted their account. This is, was, going to be short, but the memory sprung into my mind a couple days back, and I thought it would be worth sharing. I live in North Wales, UK. For anyone who has had the pleasure of visiting, it is truly a beautiful place to live, though for an adolescent boy, it is certainly lacking in things to do. As a result, my friends and I would often find ourselves mindlessly exploring areas of countryside and coastline. Despite it being quite sparsely populated in comparison to the closest cities, there is a dual carriageway running right along the coast from Wales into England. As a result, my friends and I would often find ourselves mindlessly exploring areas of countryside and coastline. Also, train tracks run alongside this road for most of its course, occasionally passing overhead via a small cement bridge. Anyway, there was one night a few nights ago when about four of us randomly decided to try and explore the inside of one of these bridges, as a member of the group had observed a manhole cover nearby which we believed to be the entrance. Upon closer inspection, we discovered that several tools would be required in order to gain entry. We returned with the necessary equipment and proceeded to unbolt the cover. This had to be done stealthily as the train track was right beside us, not close enough to be of any danger, but definitely a sufficiently small distance to cause panic for any train driver, and panic usually means police. It wasn't long before we had removed the heavy steel disc and had started descending down the ladder into the structure. Once we had all safely reached the bottom, we decided to progress to the other side. At this point, we are totally confined into the narrow space that leads into the main area. If you're confused as to what the hell this bridge is supposed to be, you probably should be because it was rather peculiar. 
I mean, I would have never known there was even an inside had we not found the manhole. Now I'm gonna butt in here for just a minute just to say that all of the pictures you're seeing right now are authentic and they're actually all from the inside of the bridge. In a little bit we're gonna talk about a return trip they made and these pictures are all from that trip. So as we squeeze and crouch and at one point scrape along our bellies to the other side of the structure there is a growing sense of claustrophobia between us. The distance from end to the other is surprisingly long, by the halfway point you can look down through narrow gaps onto the motorway below. This was actually pretty cool which helped keep us calm in a strange way. At this point, apart from the mild discomfort and confinement, we were still just a group of guys on an adventure. This was about to change dramatically. No more than a few meters beyond halfway, which we could tell due to the symmetry of the passageways through the bridge, one of us claimed they could see some object in the distance at the far end. Slightly hesitantly, we agreed to investigate. Bad move. I reached the end first, and let me tell you, I have never felt the same sense of dread before or since. In front of me was a single fold-away chair positioned facing a wall. On the wall was a partially torn page from a newspaper or a magazine showing a full naked lady in an erotic position. The reason I don't just refer to it as porn is because something was different about it. I can't put my finger on it, but it seemed more sinister than sexy, if that makes sense. More disturbingly, the eyes of the woman on display had been cut from the page, removed with precision, not just hastily ripped off. The scene that lay before us had rendered us completely speechless, and an overpowering sense of panic could be felt collectively. That was when we found the condom. The horrendous, gut-wrenching, blood-drenched condom. Needless to say, we got the fuck out of there as fast as humanly possible, smashing our knees and shins against the sharp cement edges that lined the path to the ladder by which we had entered. Of course, we were all praying to God that the manhole hadn't been resealed, as it was impossible to tell until you reached the ladder itself. Thankfully, the exit route was clear, and we promptly dashed away as far as our legs could carry us. The user then explains that he went back to the bridge a couple years later, but the people that he went with actually didn't really understand what they were getting into, and right when they descended, they got freaked out and wanted to turn back. But a little while later, he made a third trip, and that's where all the photos come from, and that's what this next post is about. The Bridge Revisited Early yesterday evening, a friend and I decided to embark on a revisit to this awful place in the hope of finding some remnants of the twisted scene that had been stumbled upon several years ago. We were not disappointed. If anything, it was even worse than I had imagined. Aside from what you will see in the photos, the general environment within the bridge structure is practically uninhabitable, as it bloody well should be, and stomach-turning to say the least. The amount of dust in the passageways is actually quite unbearable, but that is nothing compared to the constant stench that must be endured. Also, the heat didn't help the situation either. I won't ramble on, but I must express how vulnerable you feel when navigating through the tunnels. Even with two of us, both carrying appropriate weaponry, the sense of evil was overpowering. The tension is amplified tenfold by the fact that, had we encountered someone or something, the layout of the structure and the multiple tight squeezes mean a safe, speedy exit is impossible. It is truly a hellhole. Without further ado, here is what lies in the bridge. Enjoy. He then links to a bunch of images, each with some descriptions. I'll read those alongside each photo. Instantly, we came across what appeared to be a makeshift bed. The sheet accompanying the foam suggested it would have been used to sleep on. Going further into the passageway, it opens up slightly. I included this to demonstrate the amount of dust particles in the air. It was quite a pain to get any clear photo from any sort of distance other than close-ups. A used candle. And here was the first confirmation that the intense smell we were experiencing was in fact human feces. The brown substance on the paper was undeniable. Just as we approached the end room, we stumbled upon this disconcerting tape. It reads, Crime Scene, Do Not Enter. The narrow entrance to the final opening. At this stage, even with two powerful torches, you honestly could not see if there was anyone or anything in the end room. This makes for a particularly nervy decision to proceed. Here you can see how tight this section is. Not fun. More magazine pages on the floor. You can tell from the black sticky tape, these would have once been stuck to the wall. A random pile of items, including scissors, tape, and a brush of some sort. This candle had been melted into place on the wall. I imagine it would have been the main light source. The only remaining page still attached to the wall. This, unfortunately, is not the image I described in the original post. If you zoom in, the top of the page has a date from 1997, suggesting this stuff has been here for a long time. One weird thing about this specific one is the fact that that image is almost certainly burned. Somebody was in there and tried to burn the evidence, I guess. 
And here it is, folks. The Devil's Chair. There was so much dust in this area that I simply couldn't get a decent flash shot. Another attempt. Here you can see the bundle of items to the left and a blanket of some sort to the right. We searched thoroughly, but rather worryingly, the blood-soaked condom was nowhere to be found. This was strange, given the other items had remained. This is a god-awful place to be. This is what you would see if the chair was facing the other way around. You can see how the steps open so you could stand up, and also how it would be easy for someone to hide in waiting in this area. Very glad to be leaving, the final shot I took from inside the structure, just before the exit ladder. And this was the lovely view that greeted us as we popped our heads out. I thought I would include this as it did well to brighten our mood, and hopefully it will do the same for you. Although this seems like a very weird, obscure thing, these are very common. <laughs> this is going to sound crazy, but I actually went to a place very similar to this, possibly with an even scarier experience. So I guess I should probably just tell you since it's so similar and it, I just keep getting like flashbacks to when I went to this one spot. So this was like, I think two years ago and me and another friend who decided to go to this abandoned subway station that basically sits right in the middle of the downtown area where I grew up. So you're not supposed to go there. Obviously it's abandoned and it's all blocked off. Um, but you're able to go in anyway if you just climb over a couple fences. So we climb over and we start going into one of the tunnels, and luckily this was during the pandemic, so we all had masks anyway, and it got very dusty. That's what made me think of this actually, when I saw those pictures of the dust. We had been walking really deep into the tunnel when all of a sudden we saw this group of like five guys all walking side by side in a line, like shoulder to shoulder. They were wearing gas masks and they had dark clothes on. They were walking shoulder to shoulder, almost like they were in the military or something, and they were walking very slowly towards us. I'm not shitting you. We ended up running back and barely got out before they caught up to us. They never chased us or anything, but they just kept walking and they seemed like they were on like a set path or something in a straight line. We didn't want to be in front of them or get in the way of that path. It almost seemed like they were trying to like survey the area and if anybody got in the way, like they would have done something. I don't know. Basically, my point is these places exist everywhere, just beneath the cracks of the public, so be very careful, and honestly, if you know about a place like this, it's better to just stay away. Homeless Holocaust Lover. Alright, this one's pretty screwed up, just like the last one, but somehow even worse. This was posted by a throwaway account on the 17th of January 2015 to the Let's Not Meet subreddit, like so many of these stories have been. Very Sick Person Living in Cave was the title. When I was about 14, I lived in a small town. My dad was there on a temporary assignment. It was the summer of my 8th grade year, and we were about to move back to the city. I had a friend, Lawrence, who I met at the local middle school. Since my family was leaving in a couple of weeks, she let me stay the night over at Lawrence's house. Lawrence was a cool guy, but always tried to act tougher than he really was. That morning, Lawrence tells me he found a cave in the woods about 2 miles out and said, we should go exploring. In my naive 14 year old mind, I thought this was a great idea. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? Important to note, my friend had not been inside the cave yet. So we go to the location, it's pretty far in the woods and very hidden. When we walk in, we discover that other people had been there before. We see beer bottles, potato chip bags, and other convenience store junk. Then, a little farther into the cave, we stumble upon this area. This is when my nope meter started jumping. The area had a putrid smell and was lined with garbage. I saw a few needles, at the time I didn't know what they were for, a grocery bag that seemed to be their portable outhouse, and a makeshift bed. Someone was living there. I know there are homeless people in the area, but I'm on high alert at this point. I saw some other stuff that I later came to realize were sex toys. A ball gag, rope, beads, among other things. I'm getting nervous at this point. We're in a potentially crazy homeless person's den. Then, the next thing I found was beyond creepy. It looked like a photo album. I picked up the album with one hand and held my flashlight with my other trembling hand. First thing I saw looked like vintage photos of a prison. However, then I saw a picture of a pile of bodies. I immediately recognized that this was a hot photo because one of them was wearing a star on his uniform. The whole page looked like graphic concentration camp photos. When I tried flipping the page, I noticed the next two pages were stuck together and I noticed some gooey substance. I took a second to register what I was seeing. Keep in mind, I was only 14 at the time. Then it hit me like a bag of bricks. This man was masturbating to these pictures. I froze in sheer terror because I could never imagine anyone being that f***ed up. It's hard to explain the other feeling I had, but it's a feeling you get when you experience evil in its purest form. At this point, my nope meter jumped from a 9 to about a 20. I see Lawrence right behind me. Before, I was worried if I told him we needed to leave that he would call me a p At this point, I didn't care. I said, we need to get out, now. And to my surprise, he simply said, good idea. We noped the f*** out of there and didn't stop running until we got home. I realized when we got back to his house, he had a look of pure dread. I told him about the book. Then he told me what he had found. 
It was another photo book with pictures of women gagged and bound. There was also another picture of what looked like a child with a badly burnt face. He then heard the sound of someone coughing and moving further down the cave. I didn't hear it. That's when he came over to me and was about to tell me to run. We finally told his parents later that day. The police were called, but the only thing they found was trash. Naturally, nothing came of it. Absolutely repulsive. So, yes, with these last two stories, again, I want to make this very clear. I want to make a big PSA here. If you find of any weird, isolated places, do not go to them. Now, what you have to keep in mind here is that places like these are usually known by homeless people or crazy people or other people who are driven to the edge. And basically, if they don't have a shelter or anywhere to stay, they go to these places and they live there. And again, imagine the mental state you have to be in to, to be forced to that corner of the world. So, again, yes, best to stay away from places like that at all costs. Better hoogie down. This is a very strange one, and uh, I'm not really sure how to kick it off. It starts off with a post made on 7th of January 2016 by the user Wife Going Crazy to the Relationship subreddit. The original post has since been deleted, but luckily somebody took that post and reposted it somewhere else, so we're still able to see it. I'm a 32-year-old male living with my wife, 30-year-old female, of 6 years. I believe she is gaslighting me and I don't know what to do. First and foremost, yes, I know this sounds ridiculous and this will probably get downvoted as a troll post, but I sincerely don't know where to turn. I've never experienced anything like this. Little background, my wife has always been sort of a jokester. She has a great poker face and I'm fairly gullible. She'll feed me little innocuous lies pretty frequently and delights when I fall for them, but she's never kept a deception going for more than a day. She also got really into weird Twitter a few months ago, and her sense of humor has become pretty inscrutable and opaque to me. But until very recently, I've just considered it a sort of endearing quirk. So anyways, for Christmas, my in-laws got us all of Battlestar Galactica on DVD. They were always raving about it and neither of us had watched it. I had to leave for a business trip on the 30th and my wife was sick, so we ended up just marathoning the whole thing before I left. Without giving too much away, the end is a little heavy on the religious angle. I liked it, but my wife thought it ruined the entire show. I know the general consensus is that it's a bit of a letdown, but I frankly felt it was pretty consistent with where the show had been building up to the whole time. My wife couldn't believe that I didn't feel the same way as her. I wouldn't quite describe her as livid, but she was mad. I figured this was partially a reaction from her just being fed up from being sick for a week, but it was so out of character for her, we barely ever fight and this was over something so trivial. She called me a moron and ended up tossing and turning after we went to bed, and eventually left to sleep on the couch. When I got up in the morning to head to the airport, she was still fast asleep, and when I gently shook her to say goodbye, she barely roused and didn't respond when I said I loved her. Fast forward to Monday, I get back from the trip, Friend picks me up from the airport because wife has a class at the gym that she, quote, couldn't miss. We'd been texting while I was gone, and she apologized for being weird about things, and I thought everything was back to normal, but I found it a bit odd that she couldn't skip a gym session to grab me. I couldn't sleep on the plane, so I hit the hay when I got home. When I woke up, she was already awake and busy in the kitchen, which is bizarre since she doesn't work and usually doesn't wake up until 10-ish. I commented on this and hugged her, and she said good morning, but basically responded with little grunts. I was about to leave when she handed me a brown bag lunch. She has never done this before, and she said to me, It's cold out there. Better hoagie down. I grabbed the bag and just said, What? And she walked to the bathroom and slammed the door. I was going to be late for a meeting, so I couldn't stick around to try and make sense of what was happening. After I got out, I texted her frantic- After I got out, I texted her frantically to try and figure things out, but she kept responding like it never happened. Everything was fine, she loved me. She asked me to please stop being so weird. When I got home, it was more of the same. I assumed it must be one of her weird jokes and decided to leave it. Every morning this week, same exact thing. Wife is up, won't speak to me, hands me a brown bag lunch and says, it's cold out there, better hoagie down. Walks to the bathroom, slams the door. This morning I had enough and yelled at her through the door, pleading with her to stop, but she didn't say a word. Every night it's been the same thing. Didn't happen, what are you talking about, you're being crazy, none of this is happening. She's legitimately angry with me and for the last few nights we haven't been sleeping together. I heard her talking to her mother about this over the phone as well. I seriously have no idea what to do. I brought up couples counseling and she was incredulous. Is this some weird Twitter thing or a new meme that I don't know about? Even if it is, she's taken this way too far. I don't know how I'm going to spend a weekend at home with her. Does anyone have any advice? Update, woke up an hour ago with a huge headache. Went to the fridge to get a protein smoothie and saw it had been cleared of what little food we had in there. Wife was not in the house. Got dressed and went to the door with the intent of going to get some food. Saw a brown paper bag with, it's cold out there, better hoagie down, written in cursive, taped to the door. Opened the bag and a can of ginger ale was in there? Went outside and her car is still there, but as far as I can tell she took wallet, keys, coat, etc. We live about 5 minutes outside of a nice town and she likes to take long walks, so I'm assuming that's where she is. 
This has officially gone way too far. I'm going to wait an hour and see if she comes home or if she or her parents return any of my calls. If not, I'm driving up to her parents to hopefully make sense of the situation, bringing the video of her and the bag. We'll update tonight, hopefully. So, this is where things start to get a little bit weird. So we th you think you know what's going on up until this point, but really, it's a lot weirder than that, and I guess it's best if we just jump into it. This is from a while later, by the way. I am currently sedated, but I want to post this update because I don't know when I'll have a chance to next. The short of it is that my wife was not at fault here, I was. I've gotten into the habit of taking Benadryl to help me sleep through the night. My wife snores and I'm allergic to our cats, so it makes sense. And over time, I've ended up taking more and more to the point that some nights I'll take five or six if I'm having trouble breathing. I know this is probably really stupid and it bit me in the ass. When I got home from the airport, all three of my wife's cats were on the bed. I searched my nightstand for some Benadryl and couldn't find any. I looked in my wife's drawer and found a bottle of hers. She's also allergic to her cats, go figure, but also gets allergy shots. It turns out that the Benadryl bottle was actually where she was keeping her old Seroquel. Both are pink, so I didn't give it a second thought. I popped six, went to sleep. This is apparently where everything unraveled. Fast forward to my driving to her parents' house. I started feeling incredibly dizzy about an hour out and pulled over. I sat in the car for a while, but the feeling didn't go away, so I decided to get a motel and confront them the next day. I took a handful of the Seroquel and went to sleep. I got up today in this weird mania. I got to her parents' place at 9ish. Her car was there, which didn't make any sense. I rang the doorbell and her father opened the door. He was surprised to see me. I was sweating heavily and having a hard time speaking. My father-in-law has always been exceptionally kind to me, and he was sort of straddling the line between concern and terror. I didn't understand what was going on. I started crying. I brought out the paper bag and I tried to explain. I pulled out my phone to show him the video. My wife ran to the door with this pained expression on her face and asked me what I was doing, pleading with me to calm down. My in-law said I'd been terrorizing his daughter. He had no idea why I would do this. I didn't understand. She pulled out her phone and showed me a video. It was me banging on the bathroom door yelling at her to come out. She had clearly taken it from behind the couch in the living room. She showed me another of me just standing at the door before work, just staring at nothing. She showed me video of my behavior after I came home from work, and I was being much more aggressive and much less cogent than I remember. Apparently she had left home Tuesday night. I was alone in the house for two days. I just collapsed. I pulled up the video on my phone, or I tried to, I couldn't find it. All I found were 16 odd pictures of the ground and my feet in quick succession. It was right around that point that I started experiencing this crippling dizziness and this feeling that I like... can't quite describe as nauseous, but... It felt like I couldn't sit still, and I was shaking, and I felt like no direction was up. The doctors told me this was called akathasia. Apparently someone called the ambulance because I could not sit still, and I thought I was dying. At the hospital I was barely able to talk and I couldn't concentrate and just wanted to sleep. They apparently pumped me full of Ativan, and I slept for 5 or 6 hours. When I came to, they started asking me a ton of questions. Once we got to medications I may have taken, I mentioned the Benadryl and my wife realized what had happened and explained about the Seroquel. They're not entirely sure, but at this point their best guess is the Seroquel either put me into some manic state or triggered some underlying schizophrenia or something I don't know. They don't really know how to explain the delusions and the hallucinations right now, but it's the best they've got at the moment. They asked if anyone in my family had a history of mental illness, and I responded that I didn't know. My parents are pretty old, and I don't know much about my grandparents. The dizziness started to roll over me again and they gave me more Ativan and I went back to sleep. While I was out, my wife contacted my parents. Apparently my grandfather had a mean temper and suffered delusions from time to time, rambling about things that didn't make any sense and waking up at weird hours to do god knows what. He never got a diagnosis and died fairly young, but my mother and her family think it might have been schizophrenia. So, maybe something, maybe nothing. Who knows? So right now I'm sitting in the hospital, the doctor and my wife are throwing around a number of ideas, I'm going to see a psychiatrist who's going to make a determination about what the next step is for sure. My wife is rightfully frightened of being around me in my current state, and while she doesn't appear to be mad at me, she says she would rather my brother look after me until I can get a proper diagnosis or get prescribed some medications. I have no idea where I came up with the phrase, hoagie down. I was listening to a radio show that mentioned hoagies and Philly a lot, the best show, formerly of WFMU. Now, I have a million different questions for this guy. First of all, I really want to know where he came up with that phrase because that is just out of nowhere. And second, he hallucinated seeing his wife hand him a paper bag every single morning and hallucinated her saying the same phrase every single morning. And that sounds impossible. Like, how can you hallucinate something that vivid and truly believe it? But at the same time, I mean, he thought that she was in the bathroom and she wasn't, like she was behind the couch filming him banging on the bathroom door trying to get her to come out, but she wasn't even in there. 
The other one that's weird to me is the paper bag that was taped to the door that had the phrase written on it that had the ginger ale in it. That sounds like it was pretty real, so maybe he wrote that on there and didn't know, or maybe... I don't know, it sounds like the wife definitely said this at some point, right? Unless this guy is just that out of his mind. Like, the only explanation I can think of for that is that he wrote it on the bag himself. Um, but you don't think he would be able to recognize his own handwriting or remember that he did that? I don't know. I guess this is another good time for a PSA. Um, always be very careful with medications, even if it's just over-the-counter stuff. And never store medication in the wrong bottle. That is just stupid. I don't know why she did that. But yeah, can you imagine, like, drugging yourself without your own knowledge? Like, that's, that's so weird. Drug dealer's mistake. So, this is actually from layer 5 of the iceberg. I could have put this in the last video, but I decided not to for several reasons. But after looking at it again now, I realize this is the only chance for me to ever put this in, so I'm throwing it in. Now, if you're into creepy Reddit stuff, you may have already heard this one. If not, you're in for a wild ride. But again, if you have already seen this, feel free to just skip to the next one. I think I've got the chapters up down there. Like many other posts on this iceberg, this was made to the Confession subreddit, and it was written on the 6th of June, 2019. I am responsible for the deaths of several people. Around four years ago, I was a vendor on the dark net. It was a relatively short-lived thing. I was just doing it because I was too lazy to get a job, and at the time I didn't want to settle for the 9 to 5 thing. I wanted to start my own business and use the drug money as a startup. I had been using myself for years. Along with that, I met lots of people into the dealing scene and eventually started dealing myself. I have a lot of anxiety though, so I hated meeting up with people in parking lots and I definitely didn't want anyone to know where I lived. That's when I heard about the Silk Road and Ross Albright being caught. Got obsessed with the idea of it, got obsessed with learning OPSEC. Well, after a couple of months, I did. I started my store with three drugs, ketamine, meth, and some outdoor weed my buddy was getting for super cheap. All was going good for a few months. I had a couple thousand get stolen in an exit scam, but I had about 25,000 saved up at that point, so it didn't ruin my life like a few vendors I knew of. Eventually, I met a local connection that came into town only once a week, but had f***ing anything I wanted. Mescaline, LSD, mushrooms, PCP, even, and fentanyl. At the time, people weren't really cutting heroin with fentanyl. I mean, I'm sure people did plenty, but it was not nearly as commonplace now. People just did fentanyl, and they still do. Now, just to keep up with YouTube's policies, I just want to reiterate, guys, don't use any of this stuff. Um, weed, if you do, at least use it responsibly. Don't be an idiot. I put all my addresses into an Excel spreadsheet along with their name, zip code, order, along with the amount. At the time, I was selling some super white powdered mescaline. The fentanyl was also a white powder, very similar consistency. Long story short, my XL f***ed up, or I f***ed up, and about 7 people's mescaline orders were filled in as fentanyl orders. They all went out. Now, for those of you who don't know, fentanyl in really any amount at all is very dangerous. And I'm sure that if you were to have fentanyl in the same amount as this other drug, that would be it. I didn't notice and kept doing my thing for a few days. After about five days, someone contacted me and told me their friend died from my mescaline. I immediately called bullshit and went to check my order log and scale up how much I had of my mescaline. Well, I had about 11 grams more than I should have. I still don't know how the f it could have happened. I wasn't a user, but I was definitely high off dabs. I went to check my order log on the market to see if anyone had finalized on their purchase, and a couple of them were, but none from a specific day, including the person that messaged me. No one that had purchased mescaline that day had finalized their orders. The market I was on also had a feature to see the user's last activity, and none of them had logged in in at least three days. I immediately deactivated my vendor account. I didn't even need confirmation. I knew what happened. I knew I just killed several people. I sold the rest of my drugs, converted my Bitcoin to cash, and moved the fuck away. I didn't speak to anyone for weeks. Found a job in a restaurant living in a city I always wanted to. Haven't touched drugs since that day. I haven't had anything to do with that life since then. I still think about them. Every night. I saved their names and googled them a few days later. I was able to find info on four customers that definitely died. One customer shared it with a friend. They both died. I don't know why I'm even posting this, mainly because I have no one to tell, and even if I did, I don't think I could. I spend my days sober, clocking into work, clocking out of work, coming home, playing video games. I'm a complete recluse. People I used to know have distanced themselves immensely, and I know it's because I'm a shell of my former self. I can't help it. Could I even tell a therapist about this? I don't feel like I deserve to be alive. Am I really living anyway? I don't even know anymore. Maybe this will help me feel better. Holy shit. Yeah, I'm sure you can see why I saved this one for the bottom of the iceberg. Now again, I know I've issued like a million PSAs and warnings through this video, but seriously, like, 
when you're dealing with an unregulated black market like this, you're dealing with, with people who are just running this out of their fucking basements. You know what I mean? There's no regulation at all. So it's very easy for fuck-ups like this to happen. So even if you think you're doing everything right on your end, the other person could fuck up and, and that could be it. So seriously, like, stay away from shit like that. And one final warning, I'm not giving any others. Um, the next couple stories are the final ones on this iceberg. So we're at the bottom of the bottom and... Again, there's a reason why this is called the Disturbing Reddit Post Iceberg. These are terrible. I mean, these are really bad. So I'm sure I'm gonna have to summarize some parts of these stories, and I'm sure I'm gonna have to censor a lot of them. Now, honestly, I am hesitating to fill in these last couple, but... I mean, you clicked on this video, and we got all the way to this point, so might as well just finish it up. Don't say I didn't warn you. Don't even know how to sum this one up. Yeah, me neither. We're just gonna read this and get it over with. This is actually a reply post to the same ass Reddit post that was used a few stories back with the guy who put the rag in the exhaust pipe and off his tenants. Just a refresher, the main post asked people to tell a secret that would literally ruin their lives if it ever came out. Here's what one person had to say. When I was around 10 or 11 years old, one of the maid's daughters, who was probably 13 or 14 at the time, had a pretty weird relationship with me. We both mutually liked each other, but the relationship just couldn't happen because my mother strictly forbid me to associate myself with any of the attendants or their family. We did some mild petting, I guess. I don't recall any sort of intercourse. I don't even think I was old enough for that. We had a bunch of dogs in the back area, mainly German Shepherd mutts. I personally love dogs and all sorts of animals, so I frequently spend time in the back lot with the dogs. I watched the dogs mount each other and was interested in what they were doing. I even once saw one of the dogs lick its own... Yeah, we're gonna skip that part. <laughs> Someone at YouTube probably just has their finger dangling over the nuke button right now. <laughs> yeah, it was kinda gross, but I was interested. I went over to feed the dog... I told the girl about my pretty fucked up idea. I wanted her to get mounted by one of the bigger dogs, and she agreed to it. We waited a couple of days when absolutely no one was home except for maybe a couple of the other attendants' kids for her to do it. She stripped down and walked over to one of the bigger dogs and kneeled down on all fours in front of the dog. The dog started sniffing her backside for a few seconds and she got up and ran. The dog then chased after her and jumped on her back. She didn't fully fall face first as she went down on all fours again, hands and knees. The dog then went on to... Yeah. I don't know if it was because of my idea, or if there were any other cases leading to her suicide. To this day, I still think that my juvenile mind could have caused the death of another person. OP is pure evil. Now, I really can't tell which one I find more disturbing, this one or the next one, which is the final one. Um, but these are absolutely terrible, so just brace yourself. This story was posted to the Confessions subreddit on the 13th of September 2015 with the title I'm an active pedophile. This was removed pretty quickly for very obvious reasons, um, but I was able to find it on an archive site, so we're gonna go through that now. Before the morality police jump on me, I'll point out that this is the Confessions subreddit and that I'm posting because I normally have to keep this secret and I felt like it'd be liberating to just say openly what I'm into and what I do. I know that my preferences and actions aren't consistent with traditional morality, but of course that's all relevant to culture and it's just been my bad luck to live in a time and place where my sexual preferences are considered taboo. Now, I know that this is very obvious, but that is such a flawed mindset. That is like the most up justification for what this guy's doing. I know this is used a lot as an example, but it's a good example. We used to stone people back in the day. We used to literally fucking burn people at the stake. Just because a different culture and time did something does not mean it's okay by any means. In fact, a lot of the time, it means the opposite. So if you are for some reason feeling these urges, don't try and justify it. If you have a problem, Seek help before you destroy people's lives like this guy does. With that being said, I'm gonna have to summarize a lot of this stuff coming up because when I read it from the first person perspective, it just, it feels a little gross. He goes on to explain that he considers himself to be an active pedophile, which he defines as regularly having relations with minors. He also says he's a child psychologist and that his job has put him into contact with hundreds of children over the years and that he's had sex with, quote, 
only a small percentage of them. He explains that in general, he doesn't consider whether or not his actions will harm the child. But if you can imagine, it gets even worse. He then explains how he has two daughters, aged 9 and 16. He explains that he's never done anything with the 16-year-old, but... I could go on, but I'm choosing to stop the story here. Again, this has been deleted and it's kind of hard to find. I, I highly recommend that you don't go out and try to find this. It's not worth the read, it's not worth your time, um, and this guy doesn't deserve to have any more of our attention, so let's move on. Strip search. All right, guys, after, <laughs> after a very, very long series, this is the final post on the iceberg. This is all the way at the bottom. There are no other posts, and this is a very good placement because this is just nasty. Friday, April 10th, 2020. Detectives of Reddit, what are some of the creepiest cases you have worked on? Several hours after this was posted, user Luthus33 responds. This happened when I was a newer cop on patrol, long before I became a detective. I was working midnights in a neighborhood with a high violent crime rate, and we got sent to a dispute at a bar. This wasn't just any bar. We always refer to it as the Star Wars Cantina because it was always a shit show. We stopped a rip in progress in the dirt alley behind the same bar not long after this. I was working with a female that night. We made our way through the bar systematically booting people out and getting to the bathrooms. I open the door to the men's room and it's empty. Single stall bathrooms. My female partner goes in to open the woman's bathroom door, but it's locked. She knocks on the door and a female says, I'll be out in a minute. We advise her that the bar is closing. Bars close at 4 a.m. in New York. After a couple of minutes, we begin to grow impatient. Female partner knocks on the door again and the female agrees to open the door. When she comes out, we ask her what took so long. She's not providing any substance in her answers. She's wearing tight yoga pants, and we notice that she has a large bulge in the back of her pants. We believe that she was either doing drugs in the bathroom and shoved the rest in her pants, or that it was a weapon. When we question her about it, she's very evasive and won't answer us. Female partner begins to search her. As she pulls back the female's pants and shines her flashlight down to look, my partner says, Fuck! I can't really read the rest, but to sum it all up, she was in the middle of childbirth with a stillborn. Damn, this video ended on a terrible note. To cheer you guys up a little bit, here's a video of my dog when she was a puppy playing with a lemon. <laughs> hey, it's just a lemon. It's just a lemon. Hey. Don't bite the grass. Wow, guys. This has been a very long series. I've been making these videos for a while and we're at like, what? I think we're like four and a half hours now. And also, I'm posting my own fictional stories now, so I'm actually writing my own stories. I've always wanted to write a novel or something like that. So right now I'm working on a series called the Pentagon Series, and I uploaded the first video of that yesterday. Um, but I'll probably throw up a playlist to that at the very end of this video. Now it's a fictional series about some very big world events that happened in the early 2000s, so I'm not gonna divulge exactly what all that's about. Um, I'm sure you could take a couple guesses, but if you're interested in that, please be sure to check it out. I put a lot of time into this, and I've got a lot of great episodes coming out soon. Anyways, thank you guys so much. This series really exploded a lot bigger than I ever thought it would. I think we're closing in on like 50,000 views for the last two parts, which is just awesome. I, I really thank you so much. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate this. But again, please subscribe. We are totally gonna hit 100K. We're only at 1.6K right now, but... Man, I am coming for that silver play button. Anyways, guys, I'm terrible at outros. Bwah!